You're listening to the Blood, Sweat, and Business Podcast, featuring real business owners telling real stories about their real business experiences. Here are your hosts, John Chiapetta and Eric Jorn. Welcome to an episode of Blood, Sweat, and Business. I am joined by Sarah Frazier from Haas Performance Consulting. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much. So let's get right into kind of the meat of, of this episode and let's talk about more or less how things got started and really what your role is now. So for Haas Performance Consulting, I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Client Services, but I started with the company about six years ago. Company definitely pre-existed me. It's something my dad started a while back after he was working for ASA. He left and he started his own coaching company. And so he went from shop owner to trainer to educator, which he still does a lot of training and education to, sh- to shop consultant and coach. So he's a business coach in the industry. A lot of people think I came into the industry because he asked me to, which is not true. I've been around it my whole life. I grew up around the shops that he owned and never thought I'd come into the automotive industry. And I ended up about 12 years ago, I was helping my mom find a car. My mother-in-law knew somebody who owned a used car dealership and recommended that we go there. So I take my mom to find this car, start chatting with the guy who owns it. He knows a little bit about me because he knows my mother-in-law. And we start having this conversation and I feel like I'm being interviewed And I said, Glenn, are you looking for somebody? And he was like, yeah, actually I am. And I had just left a job. I wasn't sure what I was going to be doing next. And this was like 15 hours a week, come in, answer the phones, help out with a little bit of paperwork, not a big commitment. And I thought, okay, don't really think I want to go to the automotive. Let's give it a go. Yeah. Let's, let's try it. Sure. We'll see what happens. So he was a one man shop. He was a used car dealership and service center, bought the cars, fixed the cars, worked on the cars, did everything himself. I ended up working there for about six years. By the time I left, I was working over 40 hours a week, full-time office manager. I had learned how to do the books. I had learned how to do payroll. I had learned, literally could do everything under that roof except for fix a car. I Mm -hmm. could do service advising. I could do financing. I had my salesperson's license, could do all of it. And we grew to a shop. uh, We had a staff of about 15. We took over another shop. So I got to learn this business in a business as it was growing. Mm -hmm. And it was a really cool experience. And then after about six years, I just kind of didn't want to do it anymore. I wasn't, I wanted to do something different and I didn't know what that was. And I kept talking to my dad about what he was doing and kind of, how can I come work for you? What can I do? How do I, how do I get to help out with what you're doing and going to these events where you get to see all these people and you're helping this industry so much? Like, I want to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And my entry into it was, dad, what are your clients doing for social media? And he was like, this is six years ago, not really enough. And so I came in and started helping. Still is the case, by the way. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Not much has changed in six years. Yeah. So I started helping his shops with social media. I still do a little bit of that, but over the course of the past six years and talking to our clients and, and seeing these struggles with hiring, I thought, okay, I've, I would have a big, strong background in retail. I've been a store manager before. I've done a lot of HR and hiring and stuff. I said, let me just try this with a client. Let me take it over for them. Let me rewrite this job ad. Let me interview people. Let me see if I can do this. And it worked out great. And so that's what I do now. I help shops find technicians and service advisors. So I I really want to dig into that because to me that that's really cool, right? Because, um, it's clearly a need in the automotive industry. It's, I mean, it's a need in a lot of industries, of course. Um, but we've definitely noticed it in the automotive industry and it's definitely, um, it's doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. Right. So let, uh, cause I do want to address, uh, social media too, but, uh, let's go over the, um, the hiring. How, how do you go through it? What's, what's the process? My process starts with really getting to know the shop, getting to know the shop owner. Why did you start this business? What, what is it about it? What really, what's your passion and what is it like to actually work there? What is the culture of the shop? Why do your employees like coming to work? I get to know them. I do a full interview with the shop owner. Sometimes you're interviewing them. (laughs) I'm interviewing them because I getting people to come work for you is kind of sales in a way you're selling this position and I don't want to be inauthentic. I don't want to, it's a two way street, right? And it's really about finding the right fit for both. Right. 
Okay. Yes. Yep. It's, it's like we don't want to interview somebody, have them tell us they have all these skill sets, they come to work, and they're not that at all. Mm-hmm. Well, we don't want to represent a job as this amazing, awesome place to work and then send a great technician there, and it's not. Yep. So I like to really get to know about the shop. And then after I ask them all my questions, get all my information, I then take any job ads that they have out there, and I collect all of that, and I rewrite a job ad. Okay. And I do all the posting. I put it out there. So I call it stress-free hiring because I really take everything off the plate of the shop owner. I'm writing the job ads. I'm posting them. I'm going through the resumes. I'm doing the interviews. And as somebody who's come from working in the shop, I, I can relate with the people I'm talking to. I've been around the industry my whole life. And I get to know the people I'm interviewing beyond just their skill set. I kind of like to say I play matchmaker because it's it's about personalities and, and fitting the culture and finding that right person. And sometimes, you know, I've interviewed somebody and thought, okay, yeah, they have the skill set to do this. And dad and I were talking about putting them in the shop that we know really well. And I said, but he's not very talkative. He was real quiet and real, you know, and he, and dad goes, yeah, but we'll just, you know, let him do his thing. He'll do good work. He said, yeah, he probably will. But you and I both know this shop and he's not going to do well there because of the way the culture of that shop is and they're very team oriented and it's just not going to be a good fit. So being able to, it might be a good fit later, but like him right now at that moment. Yes. And, Mm -hmm. and being able to find the people that are going to be the right fit that, and even on interviews, getting to know them so that they know these are uh, companies that are really going to care about them as a person and not just a number or an employee so that's, that's what I do. I, you know, I interview people two to three times before they ever interview with the shop. So by the time I'm sending somebody to a shop, they're, they're fully vetted. We've done skills inventories. We've talked to this person a lot. So you don't have to deal with people ghosting you, not showing up, all of the headaches of going through the resumes and inviting people to, to apply. And especially these shops that are looking for high level, A technicians, master certified chances are those people are already working somewhere. And Mm -hmm. so we do the digging to find them and invite them to apply for these positions because they're not out there searching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's great. And, and just because I am really curious, what is like your range or scope on this? Like, are you doing every shop or that's just local to your area? What, no, we You're help like, shops. I could do them all. <laughs> we help shops all across the country. I mean, right now it is just me. We are in the process of growing. So I don't take on a lot of shops at once because I want to make sure they're getting the focus. You're doing they the should. good job. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so we've been busy with it. We started doing this about two years ago and it's just growing and growing and growing to the point that, yeah, we're probably going to have to bring on more people to keep this, the momentum going, which is great. It's a good problem to have. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And I think it's uh, great what you're doing because so often uh, on this podcast, we hear it from shop owners, basically any type of owner, they wear a lot of hats, yeah. they spend a lot of time doing the work right? instead of really growing their business. And this is just another stress that they have, another thing that they're doing instead of trying to grow the business. So I think it's phenomenal that you're able to do that. Um, do you have any, uh, I just want to, I really want to ask this. Do you have any situations where you are talking to the owner and you say, maybe it's also something you want to address within the shop? Like, hey, you have a shortage of employees and you said, maybe it's something that you guys need to work on, whether it's culture, whether it's pay, whether it's the amount of hours. Is that anything that you've had to bring up too? Sure. We, and because we do business coaching, that is something that I, I will. figured it fall right in the wheelhouse, yeah, right? Yeah. So when we first started doing this, it was something we only did for our clients. We didn't really promote it. It was just kind mm. of learn it, figure out if this works. Is there a need for it? Yes. Yes, there is. Mm. And so now that we've grown it and we are taking people who aren't coaching clients of ours and we're learning their struggles, I'm able to say, hey, I think you need to have a conversation with Bill about this because... So these kind of almost feed into each other, right? They do. And even oftentimes when we find a great person that we want to bring on, Bill will even help that shop craft an offer for them that, okay. that fits. So we help with that too. I did have a shop reach out to me wanting, they were interested in... They didn't offer benefits Mm -hmm. and their pay wasn't super great. And I, I, so I interviewed the shop, right. And I Mm -hmm. just thought this isn't a good fit for me to spend a lot of time on finding a technician to go somewhere that they probably aren't going to stay. And so I kind of had to say, you know, well, I, we can help you with this and, 
get those things in place, but it's probably not a good fit for me right now. You, you know, and, and it's great that you're able to do that because that level of transparency, because it's nice to know stuff just on the front end, yes. right? You, you know it then, and then you're able to make the adjustment as opposed to just, hey, let's just stick a person in there and yeah, job job's done, right? The position's right. filled. Right. Um, but again, that that's a that's a temporary fix. It, it it's a band aid. Right. right. So and no, I, I get that. You know, and and you may be looking at someone who you know is looking for employment, and you say like, okay, they have a family. Well, you know, insurance is like everything. So you know, if they have to bring in insurance, then that obviously wouldn't be a great fit. Right. right. Everybody I interview, I ask them, in your next job, what are the th- three most important things you're looking for. Please tell me what those are. I I have to know now. They vary. They're all over the place, Mm -hmm. but I will say money is very rarely one of the three. It's it's not about the pay. Sometimes it is, but for the most part, I would say leadership, communication, good work environment. Mm -hmm. Hours are pretty important to some people or the commute has come up a lot as well, Mm -hmm. but really in the top three is almost always something about the environment or good management, good leadership, Mm -hmm. So that's for sure something they're looking for. Can you give me kind of just like a, a profile of what these texts look like? I talk to people that are on all ends of the spectrum, just mm-hmm. out of school, mm-hmm. eager to get started. They they have almost nothing. Right. And so this is typically the Gen Z person mm-hmm. we're talking to, which I also do a lot of training on millennials and Gen Z and sure. that kind of stuff. And they're looking for safety. They're looking for somewhere that's going to grow them. They want the continual education. They want to work for somebody who's going to invest time into helping them become a sure. great tech. Most of the the young kids right now want to own their own shop. So they're looking for people to mentor them through that process. They're, they're looking to grow. They're looking yes. at it kind of like a long haul. So as long as they're kind of being mentored, it's probably a good fit. Yes, right? yes. So some of the techs that have been around for a while, a little more seasoned, A-level techs, they're just looking for a good home. It's really about the job security, the environment, the training. So you're talking some more like a millennial aged millennial age. Yeah. And I I would say most people I interview are gen X, Y, and Z. That's majority of our workforce right now. Oh, okay. All right. Well then I'm going to skip ahead and let's move into social media because that is, it's a big one. And I'm super curious as someone who also does social media, what, what the automotive industry should really be talking about. What should, which what is working and what definitely is not working. When you think about your audience, mm-hmm. they're not thinking about their car all the time. When uh, and they think about it very often at a very specific time. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. So when they're scrolling social media, they don't really, they're not super intrigued by seeing the inner workings of how something's done. Mm-hmm. Other technicians, sure. Other shops that follow you are probably going to like that content but they're not super interested in the technical side of stuff. So I try to be really personable. That social media is a great place to show that culture. If you're doing team outings, lunches, celebrating birthdays, showing that kind of stuff, because you're keeping your brand visible. It's all about keeping your customers informed about what you do, who you are, why you do what you do, but still talking about the business as well. So I like to do a good mix of of that kind of stuff and then some fun stuff current trends, if we can pull that in and tie it in somehow. I don't know if you remember a while back when the the Bernie Sanders in the chair was viral everywhere. So oh, we yeah, kind of would yeah. take that and put it in front of the shop. Or That was the one where he had like the mittens, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh so God. just anything that's kind of exploding, if we can tie it to mm-hmm. the automotive shop. and Because that's the stuff that people are, are laughing at. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's funny. People so. get engaged with that. Yeah, yeah. I remember a, a while ago I made a, a Barbie video. Nice. Because the Barbie movie came out. And it was one of the most successful videos we'd put out. Yes. Yeah. So, so we do that. We also um, try to tie into community events happening in their local areas. So the social media. That's a really good is, move. Yeah. It's very personal to the shops. It's not cookie cutter. It's it doesn't look like everybody else's. It has their logos, their colors, their photos, very limited stock photos. That's, you know, when we talk about millennials and Gen Z, they want authenticity. They want transparency. They don't want to see fake photos, stock photos, all that kind of stuff. No, no, no. I hear you. And especially for shops and in and, and any small business, we found that being uh, closely related to your community is key. 
you know, especially like, let's say they are doing an event or hosting an event or at an event, inviting people to come out and see them be, be involved, be engaged. Um, personally, the, uh, shop that, um, is, well, it's conveniently right next door to my house. So we, we often use them, but you know, we're on a first name basis. Um, I know them, they know me and you, you have that extra, um, you have that trust, you know, it's, I always say people like people like them. Yes. So when you know those people, you're able to connect that much better and you're more likely to connect in other places besides just, you know, when you need your vehicle fixed. Right. 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 When you're involved in the community, people see that. So when I worked in the shop, I got us into the holiday parade that our city did every year. We did Mm -hmm. a big float for that. Mm -hmm. We would have dog rescues come in and do events with adoptions and things like that. And so, and again, we're sharing that on social media. We're talking about it. We're showing that community involvement and really the heart in the business. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. great. So what, what other, th- um, what things should they absolutely be avoiding where, where you look at a, a social media mm. page and you're like, that is never going to happen again. When things get really technical, Okay. I've seen a post and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. So I don't even remember sure. where I saw it, but it was talking about reading your owner's manual. Okay. And I was like, what? Nobody's going to read their, you're supposed to be taking care of their car for them. Like that's our, our job is to help them. And I just thought it was really strange that it was like, Hey, like directing a customer to reading their owner's manual. I was very confused by it. So that kind of stuff, things that are just super technical that, your customers, that's above and beyond. They, they bring it to you to do that. They don't really need to know. You, how you to are there it. to solve their problems. Right. 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 Okay. okay. So that kind of, I mean, just negative stuff, especially this isn't really social media, but reviews is a big, even with hiring. So when somebody's looking at your company, if they want to, I'm going to dig right into reviews next. Okay, this good, is huge. Good. I have a lot to okay. say on it. Please. Okay. okay. So when somebody is deciding if they want to come work for your company before they even schedule that interview, they're looking at your website, they're looking mm-hmm. at your social mm-hmm. media, and I can guarantee you they are looking at your reviews. Oh yeah. So one thing I like to tell companies is get reviews from your current staff who really love their jobs. Have them go on and leave a review as an employee and why it's a great place to work and what they love about working there. So there's that. Back to the negative thing, that's where I tend to see a lot of negative stuff coming from the shop side is when they get bad reviews and the way they respond to them. And it's and yes, how you respond is unbelievably important. It's it so is. So this is the the advice I like to give shops is when you get that negative, that bad review, right? We we get them, we can't please everybody. Correct. Take a breath. Take a day or two, walk away <laughs> from it oh God, yes. because it's emotional. We, we remember that customer. It was a bad day. We were stressed about it. We probably took it, it home It was probably with us. raining. Yeah. We took yep. it home. We've been, you know, it's been bugging us. Give it two days before you respond to this. You know, just, just take a breath, walk away. Now, when you are going to go and respond to it, remove that customer from your mind because you're not writing this response to that customer. That customer might not ever come back and read your response, but who is? Mm-hmm all of your potential customers, all, potential, yep. all of your potential employees, anybody who's considering you as a, as an employer or as a company to do business with, that's who's reading that response. So that's who we need to be thinking about when we're writing how we're responding. So we're not being super defensive and well, you didn't do this. And you know, we're offering to help. We're offering to take care of it because as a customer, if I'm going, wow, they just threw that person under the bus and they didn't even offer to fix this bad situation. What happens if that, like something goes wrong with my vehicle? How are they going to treat me? Mm-hmm. So what is the appropriate solution? Like if you were to coach someone, I just got a terrible <laughs> review about, let's say it took longer uh, to, to fix their vehicle. And this person complained about what would be the appropriate kind of answer? Be transparent. Be transparent about it. Now, don't blame it on somebody, you know, apologize First and foremost, I'm so sorry that we weren't able to get this done in the time frame that we thought we could or that we mm-hmm. promised it to you at. We really are sorry about that. We'd like to to fix this, offer to help, give, you know, reach out to us. We'd like to take care of you. We'd like to do something for you. And then be transparent if you can about what happened or why it happened, but not in a way that comes across like cocky or condescending or, you know. Well, and and trying it don't and not passing the blame. Correct. Right. Take ownership. I think, I think transparency is so unbelievably important in, I mean, I feel it's important in every industry, yes. 
just being able to say like, these are my limiting factors. So, I mean, people always, I shouldn't say always, but the lay, you know, labor shortage is of course a big one. Yeah. Um, but if you just say, you know, Hey, I have, I've limited uh, staff. It's, it is what it is. People can understand, Hey, you can only do so much with right. the amount of people you have. Um, it, it, it is the truth. And if, you know, again, I feel like being able to be transparent as transparent as you can be, especially on the front end, you know, set the expectations. Um, so often I like to say that um, you, you uh, kind of set the expectations low so you can eat, you know, so you can surpass them. Right. Right. So with that customer who's complaining that it took longer, I mm -hmm. wonder, did we fail in the communication process along that way? Did we not fill them in once we knew hey, this probably isn't going to be done when we promised. Mm -hmm. Did we reach out to them mm -hmm. in a timely manner to say, hey, this is what's going on. We're taking care of it. You know, if they needed their car back that night, did we offer them a loaner car? Did we offer them a solution? Did we drop the ball somewhere where we could have corrected that? And now we can learn from this and make sure we don't have another customer complaining about that same thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, and it's the things that um, we're talking about right now aren't some, you know, unbelievably complex ideas, yeah. right? It's, uh, I almost want to say it's like, you know, your basic customer service, but it takes that extra step, right? Right. You know, like, again, you think about it, if, if the roles were reversed, how would you feel? Exactly. Right. That's that, that is great. Um, anything else that you want to add about reviews? Because again, they are super important and they affect your, your business on so many levels. Uh, specifically like your ability to be searched online, yes. right? And that, as you said, people are searching reviews before anything, really. Mm -hmm. Other things to say on reviews, ask for them. If you're not, if you don't have a lot of reviews, ask for them, ask your best customers, continue to ask them, ask your employees. And then if you're getting them, respond to them, the good, the bad, and the ugly respond to all of them. If somebody leaves you a great, a phenomenal review, Take the time to thank them for doing that, but in a genuine way, not in a copy and paste response that we say to every single person that leaves a review. Hey, thanks, Jenny. Right. If we're doing our job to get to know our customers and to provide them personalized service, we know things about them. We know, maybe we know the name of their car, right? Oh, thanks for bringing whatever Daisy in today. It was mm -hmm. so great to work mm -hmm. on her and, you know, hope you have a good vacation next week. We know things about our customers. Make that personal and put those things into the responses. It's not just copy and paste where everyone's getting the exact same thing. Yeah. You, you want to have again, a genuine interaction, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And having that general genuine relationship lasts longer than you'd, you'd think because so actually this, this is a, a great thing to talk about too. Um, you know, these shops are, are in a location, right? They're, they have, they're a brick and mortar and they're in a proximity of all these other homes. So typically they get locals, right? Right you can be pretty confident that you're going to be dealing with these people for a very, very long time. Um, do you have any kind of like uh, thoughts or advice on relationship building um, kind of outside of the social media realm? I do. I actually just did a class with Tracy Capriato on communication. That is, that is unbelievably convenient. Yeah. <laughs> or convenient, and, yeah. Yeah. And it, we talk, we, when we were just coming off of the women in auto care conference mm -hmm. where one of the presenters there talked about, we all know the golden rule, right? You treat somebody how you want to be treated. Yep. And they talked about the platinum rule. I've heard this one. Which is you treat somebody how they want to be treated. Yep. And I cannot stress that enough. Getting to know your customers and being able to treat them in the way that they want to be treated. Because every customer is a little bit different. Things that are more important to me might not be so important to my husband. So which one of us is bringing our car in? Mm -hmm. You know, for me, I, aesthetics are important. So going the extra mile to vacuum my my floor mats, like mm -hmm. that to me, or even complimenting me on on bringing my car in, like, hey, you've been doing a really good job of getting your vehicle service. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, oh, I did a hashtag adulting. I'm I doing did, it right, right, you know? So getting to learn the things about your customers and, and using the tools that we have to make notes in our, you know, so when they come back in, we are, because we deal with a lot of people. Trying to remember every single detail about every single person. Some people it can do not it. Easy, I can't do it, right? but take notes and, and make those experiences personal and build those relationships. And, and the, conveniently most of our software nowadays and, and the shop software allows you to put notes in the system yes. 
So you could, you don't have to remember those things, <laughs> just like calendar events, just like scheduling, same thing. Right. And you mentioned the platinum rule, which is huge, right? But it does take that extra step to go from thinking what you think, right? Which right. is, I would like this. Right. So they would probably like this into what do they like? And that, and that does take an extra step. It does. And it is, again, one of those things that can really kind of set your, you guys, your shop apart. Right. And just asking questions to get to know them. Mm -hmm. What do you use your vehicle for? What are your driving habits like? What is your commute like? For me, I work from home. I very rarely drive my car. Mm -hmm. So knowing that versus maybe somebody who drives for Uber or Lyft and knowing what they're using their vehicle for and just those little things can start bigger conversations. Well, you're right. And a perfect example, I had some communication uh, with, with, again, my local shop and they're like, oh, these things can't work done. I was like, oh, well, that's a big number, right? Right. Um, how quickly do these need to be taken care of? You know, like when should this get done? Because yes, I'm, they are more than capable of doing all the work in, in one go. It's very efficient for everyone. Um, but at the same time, if, if I'm, you know, in the situation where I'm working remote, and I'm not putting many miles on it, like oh, maybe I'll take care of it in six months or something right. like that. Right? Again, it's just an extra level of communication. Yep. And we have to listen. That's the biggest part of communication that gets missed is being a good listener. We, we tend to think, oh, I talked a lot, so I communicated really well. But what did you hear? Were you actually listening? And that's a skill. And it's one that I'm still learning and practicing and becoming better at. And actually, yeah. I've uh, joined a, a Toastmasters group. We have a Toastmasters group for the automotive aftermarket. Really? Craig O'Neill uh, started this, and it's phenomenal. I'm actually the VP of membership for it. So it's cool. it's been a really cool thing, and I've learned so much from that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, getting the, the listening, because you evaluate speakers that are doing this. So I don't know if you guys know what Toastmasters is, but it's it's becoming a better speaker but you also evaluate the meeting and you evaluate other speakers. So you learn how to give really good constructive feedback and you learn how to listen better. And I'm completely ruined by this now though, because there's a, a role you take on in Toastmasters called the, um, ah, er counter. So you count everybody's ums. I listening to speakers now who, um, a lot, it's like just nails on a chalkboard because you can't unhear it anymore. So, so I just want to take a quick moment to pause because I edit all the videos <laughs> and I, I hear all the ums, <laughs> but, but I get it right. And communication is a two way street. And the funny thing is that everything that we have discussed thus far in the podcast, the, the hiring, the, the social media, the consulting, every one of those requires communication on both ends. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. So uh, aside from listening more, do you have any other uh, kind of like pieces of advice that you want to add for uh, just general communication? I think a piece of communication that's getting missed between the shop and the customer tends to be what's happening after I drop my car off. Okay. I think about it this way. When I go get my hair done, when I go get my nails done, I'm there the whole time. I see the whole process. Okay. Yep. I see the skill that's involved. I see the, the products that are used. I see the talent from the person who's performing that service. You go to the dentist, you're there for the whole thing, yep. right? Sometimes we wish we weren't, we could just check out, but we're there the whole time. Yeah. I, I don't leave my teeth there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So, but as when you drop your car off, you don't know what's happening. It, it kind of goes see. into a room, right? And you just know things are going to get better. And yeah. And then you get a bill. Yep. And I think we could do a better job of relaying what happened, what we all did to it, all of the, this, you know, and, and using DVIs that give us all of that information that we can relate to the customer, but in a way that's not too technical. And for them to understand and put the value behind that dollar amount of everything that was done and why it was important and helping them understand that I've, I've had friends of mine reach out to me because I'm in this industry, right? So I'm going to take my car somewhere. Where should I take it? I recommend somewhere I reach back out. I'm like, Hey, how did it go? What was your experience like? And my friend Josh was like, you know, I didn't end up bringing my car in. And I said, Oh, why is that? Well, they wanted to charge me $85 just to look at it. And I remember being like, that, that's it. That's it. That's it. And he's like, just to look at it. And so I started explaining to him what just, just look, look at, at it, it yep. means and, and what's all involved in that. And by the time we get off this conversation, he's like, I, I had no idea. I, you know, and so that shop failed to, communicate and educate him on that process and what was all involved. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, especially when when you know what you're paying for. Right. Right. When you just get this huge Im- ambiguous number, that doesn't mean a whole lot to you. Right. But when it's broken down, it's like, hey, we're going to be covering these things for you. And then in in the client's mind, all of a sudden they're thinking to themselves like, oh, well, that's probably going to take this amount of time. It, it would take me six times that amount of time or effort to do that myself. And I may not even do it as well. Right. So I want to really transition now into kind of the future okay. for, for not only your business, but what you're seeing within the uh, automotive industry. So where are you guys going? Because I'm sure you're following the trend in the industry, <laughs> right? We're trying. We're hoping to grow, keep doing what we're doing. I love getting to come to events like this and speak at different events and, and do more training and that kind of thing, continuing the hiring program because we're just seeing phenomenal success with it. That's great to hear too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so rewarding to be able to put that technician in a good shop and see them still there a year later and hear from that shop owner, how wonderful they are and how happy they are that we found them. And it's, it's a very rewarding job, which I love. So continuing to grow that and just keep doing what we're doing. And we're all, we're always learning. We're always learning and what we're learning we're sharing and continuing to just keep moving along with all the things that are happening. So one, one thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm really going to put push for this. What do you think is the next thing that we should be looking for in the automotive industry, whether it's in a vehicle, whether it's in a shop, I mean, I realize that here we are at Vision and there's all this new stuff that I haven't even looked at yet. What is something that you're kind of seeing or looking forward to? You're going to be really surprised by this because I'm in the automotive industry. I don't drive. (laughs) That was not the response to this question I was expecting, but okay. I I own a car. I have my driver's license. I work from home. I very rarely drive. So I don't really, for me, I want a self-driving car. (laughs) They exist. my, my, My view is probably a little skewed from everybody else's. I'm very curious in the EVs and seeing what happens Uh, with that. So I keep telling my husband, I want to get the new Subaru, the electric Subaru. And he's like, but you don't drive. Why are we getting you a new car? Gotcha. gotcha. So it's, um, that kind of stuff, you know, I, I'm not really sure about uh, what, what we're, I, you know, I, I will add though, they, there's a lot more, uh, computers, pieces built into yes. these uh, vehicles and it's becoming a lot more technical. And that's what yeah. we're finding is more and more of these vehicles are far more advanced and it takes somebody who's not, it's, it's not just a, a few parts that you got to fix anymore. It is, it is it becoming a far more technical job. Yeah. And I think just embracing this younger generation that's starting to get interested in the industry and how do we help them come in? Are we able to provide a mentor to them to help them grow? Are we able to provide things like tool allowances to help them get started and Mm -hmm. work with our local tech schools to help these young men and women coming out of that and getting them into jobs and not just throwing them to the sharks where they're like, or just giving them oil changes and not giving them anything else to do, Mm -hmm. giving them things to do and helping build and grow them into amazing technicians. I love that. I love that. Well, let's wrap up with that. Um, if anyone wanted to get in touch with you, where should they go? They can go to HaasPerformanceConsulting.com. They can find me on Facebook, Sarah Frazier. They can email me, S Frazier, F-R-A-S-E-R, 0815 at Gmail. And then you guys are on LinkedIn, right? I'm, Everyone's on I'm LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. We, I don't think the company's on LinkedIn, but we are individually on LinkedIn. It might be, but I don't think it is. It should be. I should maybe talk to my social media person about that. That would be me. Is that you? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, If you guys need any, um, you know, consulting, please consider reaching out to them. Thank you. Thank you. You have been listening to the Blood, Sweat, and Business Podcast. You can hear more real stories from real business owners about what it takes to make it in business by subscribing to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you like what you hear, leave a review and a five-star rating. This podcast has been brought to you by Kaizen CPAs and Advisors, providing advisory and accounting services to help you grow your business. Learn more at kaizencpas.com.